The next family are the Clupeidae or the herrings. And you remember we talked about the moon eyes a while ago, and they look a lot like the moon eyes, but I'm going to show you the, the important differences here. But this is a very important family as far as um, uh, you know, the base of the fish food web goes in most of the lakes and rivers of Kentucky. So the easiest way to tell the Clupeidae from other families, and especially from the Hyodontidae, is to run your finger over that ventral keel. And you can see the little sawtooth scutes or scales on the keel here. And this is a Clupeidae or a herring keel. And so your finger will catch on that. You definitely can feel it. So this is the easiest way to tell those two families apart. Um, another interesting thing about the Clupeids, they have uh, an opening in their swim bladder near the anus. And so they can vent extra gas out that way, I assume. Uh, we need to dissect some of these shad and take a look at this one of these days. We mentioned that the moon eyes and the shads have an adipose eyelid, and this is what it looks like here. It's just a kind of like a third eyelid. Um, I'm not really sure if this is used for anything or if this is just an artifact of evolution, but this is a similarity between the moon eyes and the herrings. So probably one of the most common clupeids you're going to run into is the gizzard shad. And the gizzard shad is a very important prey fish for a lot of the um, piscivorous fish in Kentucky, Barkley Lake, the rivers, anywhere. They're not really uh, an important sport fish, but they are very important to the sport fish. They're, all these shad are very prolific. They have lots of babies. Um, the aquatic ecosystem can support a large biomass of these. They eat low on the food web, which means you can have a lot of them, which makes them good support for the higher predators and the piscivorous fish. They don't have any sharp spines or anything like that. Um, the only thing about the gizzard shad is it can get fairly large, and so it can outgrow a lot of those piscivorous fish. The defining characteristic of the gizzard shad, or one of the ways that we identify it, is by its inferior mouth. And we can also, if we cut them open, um, I mean the threadfin shad has this too, but the stomach is a gizzard. And um, basically it's much more muscular than a typical stomach. And it probably will have to cut some open, but I would assume it probably has like sand grains in there. So the gizzard shad is a detritivore and also a planktivore. It eats a lot of dead or live plant material. And so that's probably why it needs this gizzard to help grind up that food that it eats. And it's pretty easy to see once you cut them open. And as I mentioned, we can often tell what other fish are eating if we look at the stomach contents or the intestines of piscivorous fish the gizzard usually is the last thing to digest and so you can count gizzards and find out how many gizzard shad were eaten here's a picture of a gizzard that was dissected out in the lab and so it's very obvious it's much more muscular than a typical stomach so the other shad that's pretty common around here is the threadfin shad. And there are some important differences, and, and I'm going to show you how to tell them apart. The most important is, the easiest to see is that position of the mouth. The threadfin has a terminal mouth versus the inferior mouth of the gizzard shad. The threadfin shad is always is smaller than the gizzard shad. The threadfin adults will never get very large, which makes them a pretty valuable forage fish because they won't outgrow their predators. Um, if you get the fish fresh out of the water, very often the threadfin shad will have a lot of yellow on their fins. And so if you see yellow on the fins, it's a threadfin. The threadfin re reproduces more often. They can reproduce at age zero later in the year and they can reproduce at a smaller size. So that makes them better forage. They can produce a lot. 
They can stay small, so they are much more vulnerable, but they tend to not tolerate cold uh, winters very well. And so if you get much further north than this, they tend to winter kill, kill whereas the gizzard shad will not winter kill. Um, so if you wanted to talk about the perfect forage fish, it's the threadfin shad, if you can keep them from winter killing. And so here's a fresh threadfin shad, and you look at that caudal fin especially, if it's got yellow on it, it's a threadfin. Here we're comparing a gizzard on the top with the threadfin on the bottom. And you can see, you can see that gizzard has a little bit of yellow on its uh, pectoral fin, um, but it's that caudal fin that's got that deep yellow. Again, fish has to be fresh for this to be any good. Um, and so if you're looking at older or preserved or frozen specimens, you have to go by the mouth. And if you look here again, you see on the top, you've got the gizzard shad. You can see that inferior mouth versus the terminal mouth of the thread fin. One way to describe this is the tip of the lower jaw is below the eye in the gizzard shad, but it's not below the eye in the thread fin shad. So if you look at that lower jaw, draw a line back, where's it go? Um, another way, common way that we can identify these in the field and looking at that mouth is to run your finger over the nose. And if it doesn't catch on the lower jaw, that's because the mouth is inferior and it's a gizzard shad. But if it does catch on the, if you run your finger over the fish's nose and it catches that lower jaw, then it's a terminal mouth and it's a thread fin. All right, another common Clupeid that we'll run into here in western Kentucky is the skipjack herring and these are also sometimes called the hickory shad. Similar to the threadfin and the gizzard shad, they're prolific, they're soft, they're a good prey. Um, these get a little bit bigger and they're a little bit more piscivorous. These actually can be a fun sport fish. A lot of times people will sport fish for these just in order to catch them, to use them as bait for other bigger fish. But, um, you know, they travel in schools and on light tackle, they can be a fun fish. So how are we going to tell the skipjacks from the shad? One thing is to look at that lower jaw again. And, of course, in the gizzard shad, that lower jaw is tucked underneath, and that's pretty easy. But uh, in the skipjack, that lower jaw, they've got a severe underbite. That lower jaw really projects out. And so even if you're comparing it to a threadfin shad, it's, it's a terminal mouth but with a big underbite in the skipjack. And so here you can see that underbite again. Um, and they're also going to have a much larger mouth. The mouth of the threadfin in the gizzard shad is smaller. This is a bigger mouth they can be a little bit piscivorous, I believe. Another thing you can look for is that the thread fin has a thread on its fin, and the gizzard shad has it too, which is technically a, a filament on the dorsal fin that runs off the back. The skipjack is not going to have that. Now, this is not a super reliable um, characteristic because that can be lost. And so the lack of that thread coming off the fin is not necessarily tell you one way or the other, but if you've got a thread, a filament coming off the dorsal fin, then it's not a skipjack. And so um, here is a picture of that dorsal filament um, in the shads versus the lack of one in the skipjack. And the final one I want to talk about is the alewife. And the alewife is also in this group, and it looks a lot like a skipjack. Now the alewife is not uh, does not have as large a mouth as the skipjack and the alewives are not native around here. They've been introduced specifically they've been introduced into Lake Cumberland where they are to serve the forage base for the striped bass which are also introduced in Lake Cumberland. And so if you're on Lake Cumberland you're likely to run into these things. Um, they will probably show up occasionally in the Kentucky Lake, Barkley Lake, maybe in the rivers, but they're not as common as the skipjack. And so um, 
you need to be on the lookout for this. If you catch a skipjack but the mouth seems a little small, then you might have an alewife, and that would be a unique fish. And so that's really all I want to talk to you about um, with the herrings. We'll take a look at some of these. They're an important prey fish. That's all I've got. See ya.